How did I start with this book? Well, I'll tell you the story first. Um, so I was an investment banker, so Clay gave that away. Sometimes I have to explain what I used to do, but here I don't need to do so. So as I was making investments going to China, basically where I was doing work for well over a decade, oftentimes my American colleagues or my Chinese colleagues would say to me, um, the Taiwanese are terribly irrational and inconsistent in their attitude towards China. As you can see with all the policy oscillations, And, uh, and I uh, used to be um, uh, puzzled as to what to say. Because to me, I don't think the Taiwanese are irrational, but what do I know? I'm just a banker. And so um, some of these friends actually later joined the um, US government, and uh, uh, many are still active in China. But uh, the most pointed remark was by somebody who actually later went into the US government who said, the Taiwanese often appear on the front page alongside with st uh, stories of North Korea. And if you compare them, Taiwan is more irrational than North Korea. It is completely dependent on China, and it cannot stop irritating China. And I think to myself, well, all of this has data. I will go get a PhD and find all the data and explain to them, well, it's a matter of economic um, benefits. Uh, that there needs to be better distribution, it needs to benefit more people. So my focus initially was really politics of trade, how protectionism was important, and I think more and more everybody here understands it because of the presidential election. Um, but I think in those days, uh, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, it wasn't so clear. Um, so uh, what caused me to, um, to dive into identity as the answer? That's a very long story, but we'll start. So of course, the puzzle that I set out to prove was domestic debate over identity and cross-strait policy uh, intensifies on the island of Taiwan, while China's GDP continues to grow. As you can see, China's GDP was just a bit more than two times twice that of Taiwan at the turn of uh, basically as, as Taiwan democratized. Uh, by 2000, uh, this is just 2014, to be consistent with my book, but really, as of now, Taiwan is nothing is smaller than the Guangdong province in terms of GDP. So the scale you can imagine. And this creates a dilemma for Taiwan because trade also grows. Um, as you can see, the export um, part of the bar, uh, it, the dark part is export and the light part is import. So you can see import and export grow consistently. Of course, what is not shown in this graph that I should point out is as of 2015, of course, the trade surplus uh, Taiwan enjoys with China has declined to a 10-year low. So while um, trade has increased, uh, benefits seems to be somewhat inconsistent in the last 10 years. Uh, more precisely, in the at last, in the two terms under Ma ying as actually economic liberalization um, broadened and deepened. But of course, everyone understands the most important relationship between Taiwan and China is not trade, but is investment. And that makes Taiwan dependent on China in a way that uh, few countries are dependent on another country. Uh, when we talk about um, countries uh, that are in conflict with each other, that trade with each other, um, in Taiwan's case, is dependent on foreign direct investment. Here you see the light, um, the light line as uh, cumulative outbound foreign direct investment to the world, and the dark area is to China. And you can see that it's roughly two-thirds um, of the cumulative investment to China. Um, in the last two years, it has dipped. Uh, but basically, Taiwan's trade with China is dependent on, of course, investing in China and exporting uh, from China to the rest of the world, like iPhones like um, computers, and therefore this relationship cannot be uh, diverted, if you will, very easily. So the mystery to me is after collecting data for many years, I really couldn't explain the inconsistent policy. I looked at the democratic institutions that Taiwanese were um, uh, developing that was emerging. I looked at the politics of trade, those winners and losers, and all the people who would be uh, against 
economic liberalization, but I still couldn't explain why in 1996, Li Tenghui would restrict investing in China with no haste and enjoy widespread support for it. And in 2001, Chen Shui-bian would want to liberalize investment policy toward China and also uh, met with great backlash. Uh, all of these things didn't seem to actually add up with the data I had on hand. It took me a few years actually to inadvertently come to national identity literature. And um, what happened during this time from basically 1988, the ONS, of course, uh, uh, when Taiwan started to uh, democratize until now, is that Taiwanese national identity has strengthened. And this rise of a separate identity is in parallel to the economic relationship and interdependence I just talked about. Um, over time, I realized, of course, this was actually very much linked. Um, you can see here that uh, I manipulated the commonly uh, used chart from Election Study Center of National Jinju University, which is the best uh, time series data on national identity, even though it's uh, a very simple question of basically, are you Taiwanese? Are you Chinese? Are you Taiwanese and Chinese? So those are the three categories. And of course, you can also say no response. Now, what I don't show here, because the study only started in 1992, and as you know, there's polls and polls and many, many poll centers in Taiwan that would ask you, do you want to wear a white shirt today? Do you like oranges today? To everything about, would you take care of your family, your parents when, you reti when they retire? Uh, to uh, all sorts of political questions about unification and independence. But before this started, in 1989, a very well-known United News uh, poll shows that 52% of Taiwanese believed they were only Chinese. Not Taiwanese, not Taiwanese and Chinese, but only Chinese. Now, if you think about it, 1989, um, 52%. If you think of all the countries with a fracture identity um, and all the conflicts we have in the world, Ukraine, um, uh, the Middle East, many parts of it, um, if you talk about Israel, um, Israeli uh, as, uh, residents of Israel and, uh, and their sense of identity, uh, 30 years is a very short period of time. And nobody standing uh, in Taiwan in 1989 could tell you 30 years later this would be the chart we see. So as, um, as much as we see this as inevitable or uh, uh, somewhat uh, predictable, it was not so. Now, here what I do is I manipulated the two categories that said, broadly speaking, you're Taiwanese, um, which uh, meant you answer the question you're Taiwanese or both Taiwanese and Chinese. I put them in the same line, and then I put Chinese identity in the same line. This manipulation is not to sort of prove my point that people are more Taiwanese, but the primary reason really is to think about the question. What is the question? Why is this question important to the world, to Asia, um, to everybody sitting here? Uh, very simply put, the framing of the issue is, while Beijing regards Taiwan as Chinese, Taiwanese as Chinese, people in Taiwan are consolidating a separate local identity. And as Taiwan experiences the uneven socioeconomic consequences of globalization, Taiwanese are weighing the cost of deeper integration with China against the opportunities presented by China's immense opportunity. The emergence of local identity and the debate over further integration are especially among the younger generations. Both of these trends pose serious challenge to Beijing. And this is why this is done this way. If you're sitting in Beijing, this is all you care about. You want this line to grow. And that is Beijing's most important objective. Um, because Taiwan, uh, Beijing, which wants to deepen Taiwan's political and economic integration with the mainland, it wants to secure Taiwan's unification with China. Um, and I'll talk about the alternatives available to Beijing later. But this is, of course, uh, a chart that is um, very disconcerting. It's now only a single uh, digit that would say that they are only Chinese, compared to 52% in 1989. Now, there is another way to measure identification, as we know. So self-identification is also very important for Americans. You are who you say you are. I can say I'm a woman, even though I look like a man. But um, I am a Taiwanese because I think I'm a Taiwanese. But of course, it also has to do with something else besides self-identification. Being Taiwanese uh, has um, uh, something deeply uh, related to your view of the future, the political future of the island. Now, the um, NCCU ESC chart usually has um, seven categories. 
but I roughly also put them in the two lines that is of most um, interest to Beijing um, and to Washington. The preference, of course, on the top line is for autonomy. Broadly speaking, whether you say, I want, I want um, status quo uh, forever, or I want uh, independence as soon as possible, you're saying basically, I'm fa I favor autonomy. So I put that in the top dark line. The bottom line is for those who prefer unification, including unification as soon as possible, or unification later, maintain status quo. But either way, the eventual goal and vision for those um, respondents is that unification is best, if not now, eventually. And you can see that, again, the trend is, uh, to some, disturbing, to other, predictable. And this is all happening while economic integration, of course, is deepening. So what does it mean, the rise of a Taiwanese identity? Well, initially, Taiwanese identity, like many other um, emerging communities, were focused on ethnic lines, uh, whether you were a Ben Shen Ren or a Wai Shen Ren. Uh, but over time, as economic integration with China deepened, identity consolidated and increasingly embody a way of life um, enhance, embracing civic values such as democracy, rule of law, and freedom of speech, press, and assembly. Um, and more and more, among the younger generation, they use words like international recognition, also dignity, which I didn't put here, but environmental sustainability, economic freedom, and open markets, but under the premise of Taiwan first. Now this is very important because uh, most Taiwanese actually believe in economic openness. Um, and find restriction to be unnatural um, or something that they need to be convinced of. Now, um, the most interesting part of this research project over the years is I was able to interview uh, many, many policymakers, um, business leaders, CEOs, and um, civic society leaders, as well as students uh, who are very important um, in actually uh, influencing economic policy in Taiwan toward China. And in those discussions, um, I would spend a few hours with some of them uh, to talk about why you think no haste in 1996 was a good policy, why do you think uh, ECFA is a good policy, and um, nobody would bring up national identity or identity. They would talk about all the economic reasons why it's very important, and after about a few hours, they will say, but you know, it's very important if you're Taiwanese that you support this as opposed to that. And this is something that's very interesting because most people either consciously or unconsciously believe that identity is something that should not be a factor or is primordial. It's something that is divisive. Uh, but um, along the line, what I learned was actually a lot, of the, um, a lot of the reasons that are associated with identity actually are values, principles. Uh, in my book, I call them consumatory values, values that consume you, that you would die for. And those values are today very apparent in Europe in the United States with many, many groups that want to express their identity. So how does a Taiwanese express their identity? In the early days, they express it by supporting certain kinds of policy that was to isolate Taiwan more from China. And um, what I did was I went through the four different um, policy changes in Taiwan after the opening um, and after increasing integration with the Chinese economy. So in 1996, if you remember 1995, 1996, there was the missile crisis after Li Denghui visited Cornell. So Li Denghui decided to put up the first restrictive policy toward against, um, to restrict investments into China. And this was particularly disturbing to his, one of his closest friends, Wang Yongqing, who wanted to invest in petrochemical and power generation in, in, uh, uh, across uh, the strait. And he was not able to do so. Until his death, the two, of course, did not reconcile. So it was something that was very serious to large companies. And for each of these policy change, um, what Li Zhenghui started was to uh, unite or create consensus by putting together a conference. So he put together a national development conference, which is to promote support or to gain support for no haste. And it was very successful. But of course, this was on the back of the missile crisis. And then in 2001, uh, most people forget. In fact, uh, Chen Shui-bian, the first DPP president, uh, Democratic Progressive Party president, uh, came into power with um, uh, only a plurality, plurality of votes. So he decided to court the business community 
by liberalizing, by trying to re reverse what Li Denwei had done in terms of restriction. And he proposed active opening to allow especially semiconductor companies to move into China, even though they were not able to until between 1986 and 2001. And instead, he was met with uh, protest after protest by students and professionals, many of whom I interview who never actually been to a fab and didn't know anything about semiconductor, but they wanted to oppose it because they said that's the pride and joy of Taiwan. It can never move to China. And this created uh, quite, not quite the sunflower movement, but huge protest. Um, and, uh, and including actually a lot of uh, uh, mainland Chinese groups, such as the teachers union, that had a lot of teachers who were um, uh, Wai Shenren, and they were very opposed to it because they thought this was the beginning of introducing perhaps teachers to Taiwan or other kinds of future threat. Um, and you will probably remember that actually uh, President Tsai Ing-wen then was actually the head of the Mainland Affairs Council um, when active opening was being implemented. So she was instrumental to trying to liberalize, but of course it did not succeed because Beijing um, stonewalled Chen shui -bian. In both 96 and 2001, uh, you could see that most people support, if you look through newspapers and through my interviews, I realized most people associated with support for no haste as being very Taiwanese and, and being against active opening as being Taiwanese. And um, supporting active opening was pro-unification or being more having, assuming a Chinese identity. But by 2006, when Chen Shui-bian was already um, under a lot of uh, uh, he was under the um, corruption scandal shadow. And so he wanted to appeal to the base and uh, implemented active management to restrict investment again. Um, and uh, um, in that episode, you will see that the discussion has become much more rational. People discuss, what is the benefit to Taiwan to restrict investment now? And how many jobs will be created? And the discussion started to change completely. And that is actually when 2006, very interestingly, from 2006 onwards, national identity moved dramatically towards being Taiwanese in the sense that uh, those who said they were only Taiwanese, not Chinese, not both Taiwanese and Chinese, exceeded 50%. And so at this point in 2006, one would say, in a certain way, Taiwanese identity was irreversible. And that's when the discussion actually about policy moved away from identity. Few people talked about identity. They just asked, what's the benefit of this policy? And then in 2008, Mayanjo decided to reach out and bilaterally negotiated a series of uh, agreements with um, mainland China and prosper again, of course, as we know, the campaign for the economic fr cooperation framework agreement was eventually actually very widely supported when it was um, signed and implemented. Now the aftermath of it, I will talk about in a minute. Um, but similarly, from 2008 to 2010, the discussion was rational, focused on uh, effective public policy and what it would do for the community. So this is the basis, uh, the framework of what I learned, which is without a sense of national identity, it is impossible to have consistent um, economic policy toward a partner. It is after knowing who you are that you can discuss, you can identify and prioritize national interests whether the community is interested in maintaining security or equity or um, growth um, or stability. All of these are trade-offs actually that are very difficult to weigh against one another. But after those interests are identified and prioritized, then there are opinion clusters, as I call it, um, and debate over policy options. And um, I divide people into four groups that support moderate restriction, uh, extensive restriction, moderate liberalization, or extensive liberalization. And finally, you have cross-strait economic policy as a result. And of course, one can never forget that Taiwan's economic political environment um, is important, so, is so are international factors. Um, while they are very important, of course, the main point of my book is perhaps the most um, unpredictable factor in the last 30 years of this, um, the cross-strait dilemmas, because for each side, for Beijing, for tai Taipei, and for Washington, there is a dilemma. But for, in this equation, the most unpredictable factor and the most fast changing has been Taiwanese national identity. And therefore, it is something that we should focus on. So from identity to policy, you can see 1986, 2001, 2006, and 2008. 
There are four different policies, zigzagging from one extreme to the other. And in there, there's the identity debate, there is the external threat or um, environmental um, uh, concern, and there's interest that is being prioritized, and the opinion cluster that gains the most appeal. And then finally, we have the policy. And of course, as a small country, Taiwan is very much influenced by the environment, whether it's the economic, uh, global economic downturn or the global financial crisis in 2001 and 2008. Or um, in 2005, Beijing decided to, uh, to legislate the anti-secession law that led to half a million people going on the street. Those are all very important. But if you look at those in detail, those were temporarily important. But the discussion of identity continue uh, in a linear fashion. So I concluded that when identity is polarized, there's an emotional debate over extreme economic policies. Um, and the 1986 and the 2001 policy debate uh, are examples of that. But as identity consolidates, extreme policy options become eliminated. People stop supporting them simply because they wanted to express their identity. And the nature of the debate becomes much more rational. But a consensus is still very difficult, as I said, because there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs if you want a more equitable society versus a high-growing uh, economy. Or to be more secure perhaps means that you should trade with China less. But that would, of course, also cap your growth. And finally, as I concluded the book, my editor um, actually retired. So the book was delayed. And so fortunate uh, many of these things are. As the editor at Stanford University Press retired, suddenly the sunflower movement happened. And the prime example of my hypothesis actually um, uh, appeared. Identity, of course, went into the background but became salient again because the threat from China um, uh, uh, increased. And the threat to that sense of consolidated identity um, increased to the point that, of course, uh, Taiwanese students decided to take over the uh, parliament and uh, to oppose the cross-strait service trade agreement because they thought it would take away jobs, it would, uh, Chinese investment would threaten the structure of Taiwanese economy, uh, and would destroy the small medium businesses. So we have the students. Um, and in one of my talks, actually it was in Tokyo, somebody told me the story of the sunflower. Does anybody here know? Why is it called a sunflower? And what is a sunflower? Tell us, okay. Um, I am surprised only one person so far uh, this year has actually uh, told me this. But the sunflower, of course, as you know, is not from Taiwan. There is no sunflower in Taiwan. And I lived in uh, Spain for a year, so I know there's a lot of it in Spain, in southern Spain. So actually, sunflower is a symbol of globalization. It went from Europe to Taiwan to southern Taiwan, and there's a lot of it. And so it is, of course, a sign that, um, a sign of globalization um, and how the students would like to deal with it. And how did the students like to deal with it? Well, they decided to take matters into their own hand when the cross-strait service trade agreement was passed in 30 seconds um, on the legislative floor. They went on the street, and a lot of our friends, professors, had to stop teaching because nobody went to school. And in a few days, basically, five major universities stopped uh, functioning. And students decided to sleep on the street and start yoga centers and start first aid and recycling uh, centers and put an ad in the New York Times, raise money uh, in crowdfunding overnight to support their movement. Um, and you can see this is uh, inside the legislature. They put a live streaming just like young people would. So you could look, watch them all day, all night, sleeping, singing, doing yoga. Um, but what is really important is you have to compare this to where I live. I live in Hong Kong. So six months later, of course, the Hong Kong students decided, we will do it too. But the results were completely different. So there is something that is actually very different about what is happening here. In Taiwan, what had happened, actually, initially, there were polls every single day about what this movement was and whether it was worthy of attention. But initially, people were not supportive of it. People thought, this is disruptive. What are they doing? Breaking into this is uh, uh, against rule of law. Um, however, Within a few days, you can see, this is one of the weekends where actually the parents and all sorts of civil society groups decided to come out to support the students. They decided it was worthy. And not only that, at the end of the Sunflower Movement, polls show that majority of Taiwanese thought the Sunflower Movement was actually um, helpful to advance Taiwan's democratic institution. And so this is something that is actually 
uh, not often seen. But I think there is a lot of uh, uh, good leadership I've written uh, about uh, comparing um, the sunflower movement, what, what I call sunflower versus the umbrella movement. And, uh, and I think the leadership of the students as well as the strategy were all very effective. So I want to come, come to something that is uh, not in my book, uh, but the, to frame the book in a larger context. So what is important is, as this is happening, Beijing, of course, is watching. And Beijing has a bigger dilemma than Taiwan's China dilemma. So I would call it Beijing's Taiwan dilemma. Now, as Taiwan's national identity consolidates, fewer and fewer Taiwanese want unification, even under the most favorable circumstances. And I'm sure you know there are these conditional polls that say, would you support unification? Uh, would you support independence if Taiwan declared independence and Beijing would not attack? Would you support unification if China becomes totally democratic and is wealthier than Taiwan? And so on and so forth. And those numbers are just declining rapidly. So Beijing faces actually three options. But from Beijing's point of view, their options are limited and very sub-ideal. First is to do what they've been doing um, from the beginning of this research, is to uh, promote greater economic integration, more frequent political dialogue, and restore a Chinese identity and interest in unification. So this is 1993. For those of you who can remember, it's the Guang talk. Actually, I was a little young banker, and I was in Singapore, so I went and volunteered to translate um, uh, because this is theoretically a non-governmental meeting. Um, and uh, if you were there, as I said, every point in, in this history actually was quite surprising. In 1993, at least I personally thought, this is great. Things are going to happen. This is it. The dialogue begins. It will intensify. And in a few years, uh, there would be no ambiguity one way or the other. But no, things didn't work out that way. And then you have, um, uh, this is Jiang Bingquan uh, in 2008 at the onset of negotiating one of the first agreements, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, first agreements for leading to ECFA. And of course, we all know last year, uh, the Shima meeting, or for some people, the Ma Shi meeting. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, did this bring about the change that Beijing wants? No. So what else can they do? Increase the pressure, threaten economic sanctions, military action, unless Taiwan renounces independence and recommits unification. So this is the PLA aiming missiles at Taiwan. Um, and of course, we understand this is all based on asymmetrical warfare. How long can Taiwan withhold stand to defend itself uh, if it was under attack? Now, um, most people would understand it's not really about the attack. It's the perception, the threat that is uh, looming large. And here you'll see, this is uh, January. I took it from CCTV. So if you watch CCTV, which I enjoy almost every day, um, <laughs> because they have a totally different turn, take on event than uh, NBC News, you can imagine, on everything that happens in the world. And um, during the Taiwanese presidential election in January, uh, for several days in a row, they show this. This is the PLA doing a simulation, attacking the Right, the presidential um, office in Taiwan. So there, you know, this this uh, this is uh, this is a uh, uh, CCTV in Shenzhen. And of course, finally, right before the election, some of you may know this, but Xu Ziyu is a young, teeny bop singer uh, in a reality show in Korea. And uh, um, when I say increase the pressure, it includes uh, pressure like this, where basically she was uh, she was signed on uh, by an international agent to perform for this group that included Japanese and, and uh, Korean singers. But right before the election, uh, the Wu Mao uh, the Wu Mao troops is uh, basically netizens in China that um, that are paid for supposedly paid for by the government to write about whatever it is um, uh, uh, that. Um, uh, the Beijing promotes, and the netizens decided to attack her for waving a Taiwanese flag, which is what other contestants did. They waved their Japanese flag, they waved their, they waved their Korean flag, but this really created uh, an outrage uh, among the Taiwanese young people. Uh, I have not seen clear evidence that it affected how people voted, uh, but there's a perception that it did. So what is the third way to do it? Well, soft power, to narrow the gap, to undertake reforms that show that China is just as good as Taiwan in terms of the political system, to promote village elections, to basically promote civil society, like here, an AIDS group, 
But of course, we all know in the last three years, this cli the climate has changed dramatically. And this is not uh, a strategy that is actually, um, that they are doubling down on. But all of this that I talked about is unique to Taiwan because Taiwan um, views China in a very uh, different light than other countries. Because uh, one would say, well, Taiwan's China dilemma, Korea's China dilemma, Vietnam's China dilemma, uh, Japan's China dilemma. In fact, the title of my book was changed actually at the very end because they, uh, I was told, you could have 10 books in this series and you could have America's China dilemma. <laughs> uh, so, okay, that, that's great. That's a, that's a 20 year project. I could have one book every few years. But Taiwan really is both very unique in terms of viewing China as a, a, an opportunity and an existential threat, but in other ways is not unique at all. And this is what my current research is about. Taiwan reflects broader trends. So does anyone know where this is? This is Umbrella, the Hong Kong uh, Umbrella Movement. So in Hong Kong, 79 days, they, uh, they sat on the street of Admiralty, Central, Monk, Chim Tha Chuen, and then Mong Kok, and in the end, actually, uh, support dwindled. And people were very upset. It disrupted business, uh, um, traffic, and uh, uh, most people did not believe it promoted the rule of law because it was breaking into buildings and taking over the streets. Um, but this is about young people protesting for um, fighting for a political system that they believe in. And where is this? This is a little quiz in this presentation. This is in Madrid. This is in Puerta de Sol. Basically, at every um, Labor Day, uh, you have um, a big protest there. And the reason is very similar to Taiwan. In Taiwan, the unemployment rate of young people is 12% versus half of that for adults. In Spain, at the time of this picture, which is the Labor Day of 2015, actually it was 47% for young people versus half of that for adult. So we have the same situation where youth unemployment, stagnant wage increase, led to protests that is growing, growing by the year. And then we have, of course, Occupy Wall Street. And actually at the time of this picture being taken, I was right around 85 Broad Street and Goldman Sachs. And I remember thinking, this is crazy. But of course, if they have no jobs, it's okay to come and spend time here <laughs> instead of going to interviews. Um, but all of these pictures, of course, are reflective of what I call the economic um, causes um, of uh, the problems we see today. But there's more than that. There's much more than that. Uh, economic woes are just one of the, 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 what we say, the short fuse to the problems that we see today. But here is, um, after I finished the book, I finally had a, uh, um, a year to relax while waiting for the book. So I took an identity tour um, with Harry, and we went to a dozen cities. And uh, this is the, a picture I took in uh, Budapest. And you will see that there's a little flag, Taiwan flag up there. And actually, that's what caught my attention. I, my bag broke, so I went to the Budapest Central Market, for those of you who backpack. That's where you get cheap knickknacks to give to your friends when you go home. So I went to get a bag, and then I saw the Taiwan flag. But what caught my attention was not only the Taiwan flag, but the fact that I teach international relations at UVA and the Chinese University of Hong Kong, but I couldn't name any of the flags. So I felt really embarrassed. And I said, um, well, I should really wait for this guy to come back and say, what are these flags? So I waited and waited. He had lunch for a long time. He finally came back and I said, where have you been? So he says, you're from Taiwan. He goes to the back, takes out a huge Taiwanese flag, makes me take a picture and insisted on uploading this picture onto Facebook, which I declined. So this is the only copy um, of that picture. <laughs> but the, can anyone tell me what is this flag? Um, sometimes people get close. It's not Romania, it's where Dracula is from. Transylvania, exactly. So he's from Transylvania, and he is so angry with the Romanian government that he moved to Budapest to raise his children so they, they could be really Transylvania. I said, how can your kids be Transylvanian in Budapest? He says, it will still be better than being in Transylvania under the Romanian government. And he says, every single flag there is a secessionist flag of communities that would like to succeed in Europe. And so there's the Bas, the Catalan, there's the, um, uh, I, I should be able to tell you all of it. it it's, it's, uh, I have a list now. Um, but basically, he's, I said, then Taiwan does not fit. It's not in Europe. He says, well, Taiwan is the spiritual symbol 
of the struggle. <laughs> it is autonomous, but it is under threat, and it can go away any day. And so we need to remind ourselves, that is what we want to achieve, but we need to protect it as well and cherish it. And so uh, he was really excited. So what I want to talk about, of course, is in addition to economic woes like Occupy Central, is the fact that basically um, globalization may be a fact, but responding to it involves many choices, especially as perceived by young people today. Even for small countries like Taiwan, domestic factors are very important, and sometimes more important than external structure. Identity is intimately related to policy preference, leading to extreme options, especially when globalization threatens our sense of identity. For example, support for Brexit and Trump. But I would just add here that even though I wrote this, I've been uh, trying to get a picture for Brexit and Trump, and another picture I'll also show in a minute. I think Brexit and Trump actually is the direct opposite, actually, in meaning um, uh, than the Sunflower Movement, because they're supported by older generations. Um, as studies show, Brexit was 73% 73 of, um, uh, of the young, 73% uh, of young people supported Remain as opposed to Brexit. So Brexit and Trump is where certain groups, a minority group actually feels threatened. And I would say that's actually more akin to the supporters of the KMT today, an older generation that feels very threatened because they don't feel like the community is inclusive. Um, but problems arising from inter economic integration have had negative consequences all around the world, not just Taiwan, in what I call high-income countries. And what Taiwan has fallen into is the high-income trap. The high-income trap shows in the increasing inequality, slower growth, especially for unskilled workers and younger people, aging population and low fertility. And this is a huge issue. I, when I give speeches in Taiwan, I say, because I'm a woman, I can say this, please have children. Um, and, uh, and the fact is um, that the fact is Taiwan in 2011 had the lowest fertility in the world. And in 2011 had one of the most unequal societies in the developed world as well. Prolonged mon monetary easing, of course, and fiscal stimulus, the zero interest rate environment does not help because it has led to asset inflation and rising housing prices in all of these high income um, countries. Generational injustice where older generations enjoy better jobs, prospects, more secure retirement system, and more affordable housing than the young um, has really triggered something um, in the population, in the people. But of course, Taiwan is different. Now, coming back to why Taiwan is different, they blame it all on China. <laughs> young people believe that China presents mixed opportunity, unevenly distributed benefits, and severe challenges to their sense of identity and autonomy. While they are not anti-China, they are very skeptical about the benefits of socioeconomic or political integration with China. They say, just look at Hong Kong. And their instrumental concerns, as I call instrumental as opposed to consumatory. Instrumental concerns or immediate economic concerns include uh, inequality, environmental damages. But of course, these things, if there's effective public policy, should be um, solvable. And the problems, of course, are not limited to material problems. The concerns are fundamental value differences with China. And those are harder to negotiate. Those consumatory values include democracy, freedom of speech, and social justice, and increasingly international recognition and respect. And I would just say here that in my study of polls, which are sometimes very crude, but over the last two years, because of what's happened in Hong Kong, uh, many universities in Hong Kong and Taiwan have come together to do joint projects where they do open polls. What open polls are is they go to young people or older people, and they give you a sheet of paper, and they say, just write down five or 10 values that are important to you. And the younger generation absolutely writes things that are different than the older generation. The older generation in Hong Kong, for example, usually writes rule of law as one of the first values they, they, they think is associated with Hong Kong. Younger generation writes democracy. And in Taiwan, um, as in Hong Kong, one of the top five things they want is social justice and a more humane society. And that's something the older generations don't usually write. Uh, they write things like economic competitiveness, um, uh, uh, or as I said, uh, uh, in Taiwan, they do write about democracy. But more and more young people also want international recognition. And this has led to, of course, as I said, the sunflower movement. And this rise of new generation in Taiwan is also just mirroring what is happening around the world. A high level of dissatisfaction with the establishment of people like myself, anybody with graduate degrees, with a car, with a home, 
So that's us, most of us, half of us here. I can see half of you are not. Um, so the establishment versus the non-establishment, the elites, if you will. And this rise of a separate identity is a global development um, uh, that is on a trajectory uh, that needs to be resolved. They're participating um, actively, not only in social movement, but in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, everywhere, um, uh, they are actively engaging in politics, but they do not embrace the existing parties. So that is why in Taiwan studies show, of course, young people's support for either the DPP or the KMT is actually much lower than the older generations. They are skeptical, and so they form their own parties. Um, and so new party, like the new power party, they won five seats in Taiwan's parliament in January 2016. And localists won six seats in the Hong Kong Legislative Council in September 2016. One of my students was the top vote-getter, so I'm intimately familiar with um, the Hong Kong uh, uh, political competition. But in both Hong Kong and Taiwan, the cost of election is actually very high. The entry barrier is very high. But nonetheless, young people decided to do it, to raise the money, and actually won seats. So the demand for um, uh, these localist representatives is very high. And of course, as I said, um, existing parties don't seem to satisfy uh, the young people's demand. So in Taipei, Mayor Ko actually was unaffiliated with the major parties. And Tokyo Governor Koike was also an independent because her party didn't want to support her. Um, I would just end the talk by saying um, uh, that today, of course, the Thai administration is trying to meet um, a lot of these demands. But it's increasingly difficult because of what I call the high income trap um, in addition to managing cross-strait relations. I can talk more about this during the Q&A for those of you who are interested, um, but it's an entirely uh, different um, uh, subject. And I would just uh, 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 go to um, uh, a few days ago, for those of you who watched or read her speech, um, Tsai Ing-wen um, uh, basically spent the first 70% of her speech about domestic issues, which is exactly uh, what I'm concerned about. And in the last um, bit, talked about um, uh, Taiwan as a democratic uh, community. But immediately, of course, Beijing um, uh, attacked her for supporting independence. But more importantly, if you read the Wall Street Journal today, the KMT representative writes an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and also attacks the DPP for basically uh, blatantly ignoring, irritating China. Um, and uh, this will cost the Taiwanese um, uh, uh, and opportunities and economic benefits. Um, so how did the KMT become so marginalized? Um, well, if you look at this picture, this was last year. <laughs> so we've got the current KMT uh, uh, chairman, the uh, uh, last chairman, and the, the, the third previous chairman, and there is Tai Ing-wen. Um, so it's a very interesting dynamic community that is changing all the time and requires our um, uh, attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.